soon as we hit the five past the hour mark, um, we're going to get going. It's good to see faces. This is the first time I'm uh, on 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 Zoom where people turn on their camera. So welcome and thank you for joining. <laughs> awesome. Okay, it's five past the hour. See, I'm I'm. I'm right on the spot it's time it's time to get started thank you for joining us and if you're watching the recording thank you for watching us um today is going to be i i like these kind of sessions it's going to be a very very interesting session about uh, mlops because who doesn't talk about mlops and ai right it's it's kind of, it's kind of a hot topic um and uh with me uh my name is Gijsbert, by the way uh, uh technical product uh, marketing director at um, run ai and with me i have uh, uh Aiken, who is uh, very much responsible for most of this AI Infrastructure Club events. Um, so, so welcome, Aiken. But also another special guest, and I'll let Michael introduce himself, Michael Balin from NVIDIA. Yeah, hey everyone. Uh, my name is Michael Balin. I'm a, what we call a product architect at NVIDIA. It's a bit of a mix between uh, product management. Uh, maybe you could think of it as more of like a technical product manager. Um, uh, also mixed between that and solutions architecture. Uh, so a lot of what we do is we focus on areas and topics like this, like MLOps, uh, and then work backwards as to how can we, you know, leverage the the products that we do have and, you know, figure out gaps uh, that we have for the future uh, to address that, you know, that, uh, that space, right? So MLOps is, has been uh, a big area for us for quite some time, uh, at least, you know, from from before even the whole term uh, MLOps, I think, came about uh, at least like 40 years ago or so. And it's been it's been very interesting to see everything uh, evolve. And uh, also our relationship at NVIDIA with Run AI has evolved as well uh, during that time. So very, very uh, good to be here. Yeah, no, no, absolutely, and thank you for joining us because I I love talking about MLOps because it's 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 always it's always interesting to talk about it because the way the way I look at it, MLOps is not necessarily about tools or solutions or software or anything. It's like a, it's more of like a cultural thing. It's like a practice. It's like a set of best practices supported by um, tools and platforms and and solutions out there. The 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 thing though is when you look at all of those different tools, platform solutions out there, that's where the kind of the jungle starts, right? That's the kind of like, okay, where, how do I navigate this? What belongs where? What do I need to look at? Where, so how do I build kind of this structure? And when when I started talking about that and starting seeing some of the sessions, and actually we, Michael and I did a session together a couple of months ago, I think about um, a little bit about MLOps. And that's when I started thinking, okay, we, we should do a beers with engineer session about this. And I know Michael has done numeral sessions about MLOps and 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 what the, the landscape looks like and what the practices look like and the different elements of it. So I thought, let's invite Michael. And luckily enough, he said uh, he decided to uh, to join us. So if you have some uh, sh shares the slide to get us going, Michael, that would be uh, awesome. And and we. we Kind of want to walk through this uh, this whole jungle together with with all of you. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to uh, to to ask them or um, interrupt us. It's a uh, it's a nice little forum here. Of Definitely. Days. Yeah. Let me and see if I can. In the meantime, out I'll, how to I'll share. take a, a sip of my uh, beer every now and then. It's, it's beers with engineers. It's five p.m. where I'm at, so it's it's very much allowed, even on a Tuesday. All right, can you guys see my screen? It should be a slide that says MLOps is confusing. Yes, yes. absolutely, <laughs> and agreed. Let me just start playing, here you go. Yeah, so so I mean, I, I think I mentioned, you know, that this MLOps term came about in like, what, the last three years, I'd say. I can't really put a time period to it, but um, even from before we had the term, you know, this area was confusing. Um, and I think folks are continuously, even, even as we're like converging on uh, what's important or certain features, I think MLOps continues to be somewhat confusing. And just to illustrate that point, I think, um, you know, there's so many different uh, outlooks in terms of what constitutes 
ML ops or what is the right kind of stack or way to think about it. Uh, NVIDIA is a part of this AI infrastructure alliance. Um, and so I think that they this this group does a pretty good job of uh, you know, putting together what are all of the different constituent parts to what could make up ML ops. Um, but really just to illustrate the point, I mean, you could have uh, you know, a more uh, flow oriented kind of diagram that shows you every single detail, you know, including the schedulers, feature store. Um, you know, often, you know, you see a, a mix uh, or conflation between, you know, what is the process, what are the people or, or the, um, you know, the, the roles uh, that are involved, uh, what are all of the features, um, you know, into in some sort of a, a mixture, right? And here's yet another representation of it. Um, so, I mean, the point is, like, there's so many different representations, and I think um, MLOps is increasingly like DevOps in that, um, you know, you could, there's no one way to skin the cat. And um, at the same time, there's just, you know, hundreds of tools uh, being made, hundreds of solutions, thousands of solutions uh, being made, you know, every day uh, that address this space. And it gets really confusing, right? It gets confusing if you are trying to um, you know build an MLOps system especially at a larger organization where you're tasked with doing so um, many times i'm in conversations with folks who you know really desperately want to just buy one solution uh, and and i have to tell them no you can't really do that right now um, you know the best you could do is x and then add you know y and z right um, so and and because there's so many different solutions folks get confused as to like what kind of features should they be concentrating on how do things work together you know so there's just there's just generally a lot of confusion and i'm sorry for you know maybe starting this talk you know with that uh with 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 all of that um confusion but i think you were even nice yeah. because you used the mad landscape of 2022 or 2021 there's a new one out mm. there with more logos <laughs> so so that's, that's right. uh, that makes it that makes it even more confusing so so what we like to do is um i mean and, and this is how we approach mlops internally at nvidia because we have we don't again we don't we don't have one single system uh, that we use for quote unquote ML apps, um, but we generally build systems that are specific to the use case or what we're, you know, the type of AI that we're trying to build. And I think two, two major um, areas that I would, uh, you know, single out maybe because they're good, not only good examples in their own right, but they're somewhat good contrasting examples um, is the first one would be autonomous vehicles, which is really where uh, at least I personally came into contact with this whole notion of like having a real MLOps uh, flow within NVIDIA. Um, and it was from our team that was building, you know, autonomous vehicles and that out of necessity, they had to think through this whole process because they're producing, uh, you know, AI and vehicles that could, you know, they could hurt people, right? They're, they're, the AI is going on the road, right? And so you have to have all sorts of stringent processes and procedures, um, you know, in, in terms of how you are collecting data, um, you know, you're, 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 you can't just like raw use the data, you have to, you know, make sure that um, you're adhering to certain privacy and regulations, you have to make sure that you are labeling and, you know, uh, doing all sorts of things with the data. Anyhow, we'll, we'll go through this uh, process just as a quick example. And it'll show you like how do we you know think about MLOps in this particular use case. So we're collecting a lot of data from uh, for this AV use case. Everything you know most obvious is camera video data, but also uh, you know for the the cars that we train with, uh, there's a lot of uh, radar, lidar, and ultrasonic data. So lots of sensors that we uh, ingest data from, uh, and then there's of course GPS. Um, data <clears throat> that we uh, in, ingest as well. So all of this, <clears throat> all of this, it's 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 uh, you know Im important to think about that we're collecting all of this data from the vehicles themselves. But there's a massive effort in terms of uh, taking that uh, data and ingesting it and putting it into one place and then curating it. Uh, there's a lot of um, effort that needs to be and tools that need to be 
uh, made for that explicit purpose. Then uh, in terms of actually using the data before we could even train on it, we have to do a lot of uh, labeling and data prep. There are tools, again, that are specific to this these uh, parts of the process, especially labeling. We built uh, our own homegrown labeling uh, solution where human auditors across the globe can log in and essentially uh, look at all of the data and, um, and, and label it. Uh, many systems um, that are really sophisticated also enable a sort of like voting mechanism so that it's not just one human auditor looking at one piece of data at a time, but it's you're getting some parity between like three or five different auditors looking at data at the same time. And so that's the kind of system that, you know, we've built. Uh, there's a lot uh, that goes into data prep, um, even if it's not just for the video feed, but there's, uh, you know, data that we collect in terms of, of metrics or metadata that also needs to be prepped. Um, and we use, uh, if you're familiar with Rapids, we, we use that as part of the, the process uh, as well. And then we get to the part that everybody, you know, talks about for AI, but, you know, you, as you see, there's so much that went into the initial part, maybe 50 or 60% actually of the whole, uh, of, of the work really goes into the, the data, the data part, right? And then uh, we have uh, the actual training and validation and the validation, especially in this AV case is actually quite stringent because as I mentioned, it's, we're dealing with a a system that could um, potentially injure uh, people. So we have to do a sort of offline validation uh, where we're testing the model in itself with some uh, separate uh, data set that we've collected. Um, and then uh, as we evolve, let me see if I can move this, there we go. Yeah, as we evolve, um, we also uh, have to mm, not just take, we, we don't just use the model as it is, we have also have to encapsulate it in some software that uh, would allow us to deploy it to a vehicle. And then once we do that, we can do, uh, you know, other stages of validation, uh, where we're also testing, um, you know, test and retesting uh, that the, the vehicle works uh, as expected. And then finally, we're able to do our deployment process and we want to continue to improve the model. Uh, so any sort of telemetry and log data also goes back into the data ingestion process along with new data that we collect from the sensors. So all of this is, um, I think, a good example in terms of, you know, a unstructured uh, plus some structured data type of use case where we're uh, training a model. Um, this is all running for, on, a, on a ton of Mercedes Benzes, right? I think I've seen it on the video. Uh, yeah. Isn't it in Munich somewhere? Um, most of the testing that I'm familiar with, we do in the Bay Area, but it's possible maybe you've, maybe you've seen something where we've heard, uh, also. Yeah. yeah. I heard something about an experience center in Munich. So Aiken is actually from Munich. So that might, maybe uh, we can get you like a Mercedes that yeah. uh, and you don't, ha you don't have to drive. <laughs> <laughs> I wish, I wish. <laughs> cool. So the maybe the contrasting case would be a structured data use case. So um, if we're thinking about recommendation systems or recommendation engines, uh, you know, this is a case where um, you know we're we're looking to provide uh, based upon previous customer purchases or. Uh, what they've looked at or what they've, you know, what customers have put in their carts, essentially what, what is a good prediction for what they might buy in the future? What could we suggest to them, uh, you know, so that they might, uh, you know, click the button and they might uh, actually purchase something additional. Um, so in this case, you know, there's, uh, this is where we're dealing with structured data. We're dealing with uh, data that is either events-based or like we could essentially put in some sort of uh, you know, columnar type of database. Um, this is uh, maybe more straightforward of a, of a case in, than from the unstructured uh, data one with AV, um, but uh, it, it involves, uh, you know, different set of solutions typically. Um, and so the data part is no less uh, important. 
But in this case, um, you know, maybe some of the differences to single out is that we might we'll likely leverage uh, a feature store and a lot of the uh, you know uh, data curation process and training process will be around uh, engineering features and figuring out which ones actually uh, relate to a better uh, a better AI model. Um, let me put that in context. And then, and so a lot of this, um, maybe a lot of the difference here is also, you know, once we have a model and we are deploying it in a production uh, infrastructure, uh, a lot of what we might do is uh, we, we would leverage uh, streaming data. So continuously, um, you know, data that's coming in and, uh, uh, you know, essentially leveraging the model. Uh, we'd want to track all of, you know, how the model is performing in that production type of uh, environment. So, I mean, maybe I, I singled out a few examples, uh, a, a few differences, excuse me, but, uh, you know, maybe one of the big ones between uh, unstructured and structured data might be leveraging, uh, you know, labeling type of solution versus, versus a feature store. Um, maybe another uh, might be uh, you know, deploying the model, encapsulating it into an application uh, for the vehicle, uh, which is a bit more complex uh, versus leveraging the model in some sort of a streaming type of uh, fashion. Um, and then uh, in terms of collecting and recollecting uh, data, there are obvious differences there. So, you know, this is just, just hopefully these two examples illustrate that like no one ML ops solution is going to, uh, to solve all uh, all use cases, or else you just have to build some mega MLOps type of uh, solution using all of the different all uh, lots of different constituent parts to be able to be flexible enough to address both types of use cases. Um, there are there are a couple of other considerations too. Um, I'll just quickly go through them. Um, and by the way, this presentation is like a sort of abridged version of our MLOps 101 talk uh, at GTC. So if you're if you're curious, if you want to hear the longer version, you can always go to the, our GTC website and uh, look for MLOps 101. Um, but so the the, the quick uh, other considerations might be um, there are some industries and use cases where we want to uh, you know leverage uh, some pri privacy preserving uh, functionality, and or we want to uh, do some sort of distributed training. So we have um, frameworks which allow, uh, excuse me, which which allow um, you know disparate groups with precious data to uh, you know not necessarily share the data with each other, but at least allow them uh, to execute in a sort of federated manner where they can train models um, based upon an aggregate set of, uh, of of you know multiple different parties' data. Um, and so that is a different kind of flow uh, that one might consider in terms of building a model. Um, let me see. Also, sorry, my cursor is like is is uh, is uh, disappearing every time I try to click here. Um, another one is another consideration might be you know, for inference for some of these very large models that are being built today, like LLMs are pretty, pretty game changing, not just in terms of what they can do, but um, also in terms of the uh, compute that is required, right? Uh, uh, we, we need some pretty, uh, you know, intense uh, compute just for the inference portion. And also if we want to kind of p-tune or fine tune uh, the models uh, with new data. So um, there's a different flow and different considerations uh, for, you know, for LLMs that one might uh, need to also incorporate. So how do we, so how do we redefine uh, MLOps given all of this? Um, you know, I think, uh, you know, I, I love this diagram because we really focus on uh, when we talk about MLOps, we tend to focus on like just the small green dot, which might be, you know, just the AI training portion, but there's just so many other different parts uh, to the process that uh, folks often overlook. Um, and so in a new kind of diagram, uh, you know, I hate to be 
uh, adding yet another schematic or yet another diagram, but here I am uh, doing that. Um, you know, we're seeking to essentially, uh, you know, help uh, refocus, you know, what is actually really important here in terms of MOOPs. And um, because there's so many different solutions out there, part of our perspective at NVIDIA is how, how do we classify all of these different solutions, right? So that if you are coming in um, and you're a particular type of, uh, of organization or particular type of user, and you have a particular type of use case, um, what could I recommend to you that, that makes a lot of sense, right? And so, um, you know, in the middle here, we have the, the whole process flow, uh, you know, from when you're first ideating and exploring, you know, what, what kind of data that you have to uh, training and eventual, you know, deployment and then continuous uh, process improvement of your MLOps cycle. Um, that's the, the middle part is the process and it incorporates, you know, the, the individual uh, roles like the data scientists, the business analysts, data engineers, ML engineers, et cetera. Um, but then we also, uh, in, in these gray boxes at the top and the, at the bottom, uh, you know, seek to essentially classify what part of the different parts of the process uh, might be useful, um, you know, and what kind of solutions should you be looking for, depending on what you're, you're actually interested in. So the very top box is end-to-end -end ML platforms. And those are really solutions that are uh, trying to do everything, you know, from soup to nuts. Um, maybe I think we actually even get into here. And some, some suggestions um, of that, the, the CSPs, uh, so they offer uh, solutions like SageMaker, Vertex AI, Azure ML. Uh, you might be familiar with those types of solutions. And then there's also uh, solutions that could be offered in an on-prem kind of or hybrid cloud kind of fashion, which is Domino Data Lab and DataIQ um, make solutions that are in this space. Uh, open source, you could have um, Kubeflow and Open On Demand, uh, which try to be this kind of end-to-end -end or offer this kind of end-to-end -end solution. But there's always going to be gaps and the devil's in the details. There's There's almost always going to be things that uh, one has to add to any of these solutions to truly make it end to end for, for any pretty much any use case right. Um, another, uh, you know, focus area uh, for us, uh, because it just comes up so often is how do I do like interactive uh, development, um, you know, so this is where I might, uh, you know, classically use something like Jupiter or our studio, um, you know, this is another uh, uh, area like that's that's often important in some of the end-to-end -end solutions, uh, but also just important in its own right. So it's not uh, it's not unlikely that many times we deploy uh, a cluster and all that we're really doing within it is um, you know uh, spinning up like a notebook server where we can uh, allow data scientists to just log in and uh, and 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 have Jupiter attached to a certain amount of uh, of compute. It's, um, sorry, to jump, yeah, sorry to jump in, but the, the Jupyter one is very interesting. I just spent a week at KubeCon and uh, the amount of conversations I had about Jupyter Notebooks versus just talking about Kubernetes was insane. It seems like uh, uh, all the platform owners nowadays need to make sure that data scientists have access to Jupyter Notebooks to work their magic. It's uh, Jupiter is, uh, is, is something that uh, um, pops up all the time in conversations. Absolutely. Yeah, it's a, it's a really big one. I mean, really when this space was first starting to evolve, um, I, like 80% of the requests that I saw were, okay, it's great that you could deploy like a Kubernetes cluster, but I really want, you know, some way to uh, spin up Jupiter. I want some automated way that like anybody can log in and just request Jupiter um, and and give it to the user, right? So uh, there's yeah, there's other solutions I'm not pointing out here that um, that offer that type of uh, of solution. I'd say it's a pretty solved uh, problem. There's just you know there's lots of different solutions in the space that that do it, and oftentimes, like I said, it's part of um, it's part of uh, solutions, uh, 
that already exist and they may not tout it as a feature, but it is a pretty important uh, part of the development life cycle, right? Um, another another really important part is like the, the data wrangling, analytics, labeling, you know, we talked about labeling solutions, um, but there's a lot obviously that goes into just the data analysis portion. So we have some examples here. Um, Data robot, data IQ, uh, heavy AI. Heavy AI is an interesting one because it leverages GPUs uh, for as a, uh, if you're familiar with uh, like a, a GPU database. Uh, so you can load essentially a large, very, very large data set into GPU memory. And then all of the queries uh, that you're executing uh, are, are being done via the GPU. So you can just do this kind of really, really interesting, fast analysis, uh, exploratory work uh, that would have normally taken you just ages uh, to do. You can do it in a matter of seconds. Uh, so you can really explore the data. And then uh, uh, we, we work with a bunch of different labeling solutions. So label box, scale, app, and uh, these are all focused on just, you know, providing, uh, providing labeling in, in house uh, at NVIDIA, we, we build our own uh, kind of uh, solution as well. And then open refine is an open uh, open source project. But again, in this space, whenever we're talking about data, it's really important to think about, uh, are we talking about a problem with largely, you know, unstructured data, or is it structured? Uh, something like open refine is very much just for structured data. And then, you know, labeling solutions much more for uh, typically for unstructured work. <clears throat> Um, experiment management, also really important. If you don't track experiments that you run, uh, you won't really be rigorous or scientific in your approach. And then you also can't jump to, uh, uh, or typically it's more difficult to jump to um, other things that you might want to accomplish in a more automated uh, fashion, like a hyperparameter optimization or auto ML. Um, so MLflow and Ketib are good open source projects here. We do a lot of work with weights and biases. I think uh, the folks that run, you guys do too. Uh, and Comet ML is another good uh, solution in this area. Yeah, we, we actually have uh, one of the weights and biases uh, advocates uh, online <laughs> right now, which is a Aiken. It's, uh, she loves weights and biases. Yes, I'm loving it. It's, it's very I'm just friendly, <laughs> so easy to use, and it's so perfect for evaluations. It's a really great, yeah, it's a really great solution also because you could use it pretty much anywhere. Uh, similar, similarly with MLflow, uh, right? You just like import the library and you're, you're off to the races. So um, unfortunately, a lot of the other areas of MLops are not so easily uh, used, right? You, you, you have to deploy something or you like, you really have to, uh, do some work to integrate. Um, that's one one area. This ex like experiment management is like very easy to integrate into an existing uh, platform, right? So <clears throat> pretty interesting. Uh, feature management. So sorry, can I sorry can I just add a point um, to your yeah. um, step here with regards to data federation? I've been playing around yeah. with the NV Flare that you guys launched last year. Um, and mm -hmm. I can really, I mean, I'm, yeah, very satisfied with it. And it's um, cool to see what you're doing there too. Um, can really, that's awesome. Yeah, that's if, what people, I was, if people want to look into like federated federal learning, I can, yeah, definitely recommend it. That's awesome. Yeah, that's what I was alluding to earlier with the consideration for privacy and federate, you know, uh, can't remember what I called it, but yeah, it's essentially NV Flare is, is focused on that area. So we do a lot of work with research institutions where uh, that that kind of solution comes in in handy. So glad that you glad that you're enjoying it and using it. Um, for feature management, uh, so again, focus maybe more on like the structured data uh, type of problems, but we have Hopsworks and Tecton that we work with and then Feast as an open source uh, solution. Uh, model ops, this is like a whole burgeoning area. Very interesting, uh, lots of different solutions. I mean, you could think of uh, serving the model once you have it, um, you know, which you could use something like Triton, which is NVIDIA made. Uh, we do a lot of work uh, in Triton uh, where we leverage TensorRT, uh, which is our 
uh, framework for um, essentially, you know, making the most uh, uh, performant type of model that you would use uh, in production. Um, and then we put a lot of work into in Triton in terms of how can I deploy multiple models that leverage a, a single GPU or load balance them across multiple GPUs. Uh, so what a really great prop platform, especially if you're trying to go into production with GPUs. And Selden, uh, of course, is uh, another good solution uh, in this space. For uh, you know, it, it's not model ops isn't just the model serv serving portion, though, really important pieces, uh, the monitoring por portion. How do I detect model drift, data drift, etc. Um, and so, you know, we, we work with Fiddler, Arise, Bento ML and Gantry um, and uh, weights and biases and MLflow also offer, you know, some solutions uh, or features in the space as well. Um, going back to the, the data portion, uh, you know, there, these are, um, you know, or we're talking about these towards the end, but they're, they're actually really important, uh, things to consider, uh, in a MLOps platform that I even think of them as table stakes. Um, and so data management is one very, one very, very important thing, um, similar to experiment management. If you're not tracking your data, if you're not versioning it. Um, you know, you, you won't have a very rigorous or reliable uh, system. So we work with uh, Pachyderm, uh, Snowflake, um, uh, but you could, you, there, there are a lot of uh, storage partners that we work with that provide uh, specific solutions in this space. Uh, pipeline management, this is another one similar to experiment management that it's easy to just add on, um, you know, if you have an existing solution. Uh, producing a pipeline is quite straightforward. So uh, Apache Airflow uh, is a good solution in this space. There's there's various others, uh, you know, too long to list out, but we've listed out a few here, like Luigi Flight, et cetera. And sorry, I'm really trying to just go through this quickly. Maybe we'll, you know, have a better conversation after we put the, the groundwork here. Um, but getting to... Uh, you know, another table, or at least like what I see is like table stakes uh, portion of the of building MLOps or an MLOps platform is what do you do for infrastructure management and the scheduling portion? And this is where Run AI uh, comes in in, in in full force, right? Because um, we need some sort of solution to aggregate uh, or collate like uh, compute resources, whether they're on prem or they're in the cloud. Um, how do we you know, take all of those resources and attach a scheduling layer on top of it such that we could use it for any of these other functions. How are we gonna use uh, the compute for spinning up a Jupyter notebook? How are we gonna use the compute for, uh, you know, running a more complex uh, job or like a pipeline of jobs? How are we gonna use the compute for uh, running, you know, dozens or, or hundreds or thousands of experiments that we, we, we might want to use? How are we gonna use the compute for uh, model serving and, you know, monitoring, right? So uh, really the basis and, and the reason why we work so much with Run AI at NVIDIA is like the basis for a lot of things that we do is how do we provide that, um, you know, that underlying layer of some sort of scheduling uh, functionality, right? So Run is a really great partner that we work with in this space. There are also open source solutions um, that are out there. Uh, so, you know, and we, we've tracked for quite some time. Uh, so you, one could leverage something like Kubernetes with Volcano or, or Amada. Um, we also do a lot of work, uh, you know, internally at NVIDIA with Slurm. Um, but, you know, just like so many areas of, of MLOps, the complexity is not just in like the particular scheduling solution, but how does it work? How does that solution work with other aspects of the of the platform. And that's where I think run is a really interesting uh, solution. It's unobtrusive. We can still use Kubernetes for what it's it's good at and then use the run AI scheduler for batch scheduling. Um, and uh, we can also do a sort of like meta scheduling. So collecting lots of disparate resources in different clusters and uh, have users schedule across them, right? Which is something that's missing from other solutions that we see out there. We actually, and this is a, a nice little way for me to uh, 
inject another Beers with Engineers session we have coming up, which is I think is next week. It's actually with uh, G Research, um, who are uh, the people behind the Amada scheduler. So we're going to do like a whole session about scheduling and why it's so important. And I think Michael hit, hit some great points. And of course, I'm pretty biased towards Run AI, which I'm, I'll try to let go. But I think, uh, especially when you look at Kubernetes as like an underlying platform um, to run all these workloads on, and, and, and let's be honest, most of the tools that we talked about right now, they all support <laughs> running their workloads or executing your workloads on using containers on on Kubernetes. That's when you you hit some of the the challenges with regards to scheduling and making sure that I mean every step of this, they all have one thing in common. They only compute. <laughs> and uh, they need it in an like in an optimized way. And I think this is where schedulers really can help. Whether you're talking about Armada, Volcano, Run AI, I think there's a uh, unicorn is one i actually talked to uh to the uh um uh, the author uh the first author of uh, who started the unicorn project and we had a fun little discussion about scheduling but it's 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 becoming so important and i think whenever you talk about ml ops i always picture this iceberg and people get tired of my iceberg but my my, my iceberg shows basically anything in the uh, the gray blocks in the middle as like on top, like uh, above the surface. And then everything that's related to infrastructure and resource management and infrastructure management is kind of below the surface. Because what happens is we, we hire these like crazy smart people to develop AI models. We throw tons of infrastructure against it that's being managed by like, infrastructure teams and platform teams. We're kind of missing the whole, let's make sure that these two work together and these two get aligned. Um, and that's and that's where our scheduling comes into place. That's that's like a nice little plug for our session uh, session next week um, with the guys from Armada. Uh, I think it's Kevin and Alex, Alex and David. Oh, see, yep, wonderful. We've got three of them. I actually met with them last week at KubeCon again, and we'll also have two of uh, or at least one of our developers joining, who's uh, responsible for scheduling as well. So it's going to be a very very interesting session. Sorry, not trying to downplay this. No, that's awesome. I, I might tune into that. That's that's a very interesting. Yeah. So I mean, that's <clears throat> that's incredibly important uh, portion of things. Um, I like your. I, I always love your ice iceberg uh, metaphor, ice. So, uh, and I totally agree with it. It's kind of funny because at Nvidia, it's almost like we see the iceberg in in you know flipped upside down. Uh, because we're constantly focused on, uh, you know, building all of the hardware, and then we focus on, you know, low-level drivers and software like CUDA, and then, you know, um, we have lots of internal battles around what kind of scheduling system uh, to use, whether it's based off Slurm or Kubernetes. And so, you know, before we even get to any of these other layers that we're calling like infrastructure agnostic, like we we focus so heavily on that infrastructure aware piece uh, within within Nvidia and consequently <clears throat> you know it's it's what uh, when we're building uh, these large clusters um, for for our customers you know that's what we also uh, focus very very heavily on um, because if you can't if you can't schedule if you can't use uh, you know a large cluster in a um, in a smart way, it's just going to sit there idle and you're not going to make, make good use of all of that compute. It's just going to be burning up, um, cycles. Right. So, yeah. So now yes. when we take a step back, yeah, sorry. Yes, sir, no, and, and just relating to our previous session, that's a big waste of resources and, uh, and the environmental impact is, is insane. Also probably a very interesting session for you to watch. Michael, we had a session with Matt Watts about the environmental impact of AI. I mean, every time you send an email, half a gram of CO2, am I quoting that correctly again? I think um, so. Yes, see, so more Slack, less email. Um, but yeah, <laughs> it's, uh, it's uh, um, don't waste your resources. Yep, absolutely. And so, so when we take a step back here, you know, I, again, I apologize for going so quickly through all of the examples and and kind of jumping through uh, all of the all of the different uh, uh, different types of solutions that constitute the space that we call MLOps. Uh, but when we take a step back, maybe it makes a little bit more sense, um, at least in terms of how 
uh, these solutions fit in. You know, there's no, generally there's not solutions that just focus on one particular part of the process. Um, they'll try to do, you know, uh, one or several different things. And then there's solutions that really try to be end to end. Uh, there's solutions that like run that are really focused uh, more on enabling lots of other solutions by being, you know, the, the scheduling layer, if you will, uh, and then plugging into other uh, solutions. Um, so yeah, just a very, very interesting and evolving space. Uh, if I could say just one thing, you really have to um, be aware of like what it is you're trying to accomplish and then pick you know, several, two or three, I would say at minimum different solutions and put them, you know, piece them together to get a sort of end-to-end -end type of, true end-to-end -end type of solution. So yeah, that's that's it really for, uh, you know, the slides. Curious if there's any questions or anything we want to talk about, Heis, uh, I can. Yeah, so I'm, I'm interested to see, I, I don't know if people want to speak up or are able to speak of, or I don't want anyone to reveal like company secrets, but like uh, um, if there's anyone that's like working on an ML system right now, what is it, what does it look like? Is this is familiar or like things that um, like best practice you want to share? Um, that would be interesting. If not, absolutely fine. Questions for how we do it in NVIDIA. I mean, I'm very interested in listening to how NVIDIA built it because um, especially with all the different teams you have within NVIDIA, I mean, NVIDIA is pretty pretty huge in the work you do on like all the, the frameworks. I'm always amazed to see every every keynote that, uh, that Jensen does at GTC is like uh, everything's a million times faster. And um, like, I think it's every, every time it's like more than a hundred frameworks have been updated and new ones are being released so how do you how do you guys manage it with all those different types of expertise because you talked about automotive you talked a little bit about recommendation systems but you guys do nlp llm um the whole uh digital twin uh work as well how do you how do you how do you manage all those themes yeah well i mean yeah, it's such a great question and i mean i think it uh, the answer reveals maybe like the, the, the dirty or hidden secret, you know, uh, which is we invest a lot in, uh, in DevOps, like in our folks that build these platforms, right? And so um, while there are some platforms that we build internally that are meant to be more or less like universally used, each team uh, tends to pick their own, you know, uh, tools and, and solutions. And Largely, like when we're developing these models, the teams that are doing all of the research, they're using, you know, a Slurm based uh, cluster. And even before that, um, you know, when we come out with new compute, like, for example, the next DGX system or the next, uh, you know, uh, GPU card, whether it's like going from A100 to H100, um, we really dog food a lot and we build large clusters uh, ourselves. And then we open those clusters up to our internal researchers. Um, so they constantly have the best compute at their fingertip tips. They're using more like old school HPC type uh, solutions like Slurm uh, to get their, their work done. Um, and, and really it's only uh, in the cases where we have something like we're developing, you know, AV models or um, you know, or, or where we have to have a more sophisticated flow. And that's when, again, we develop a lot of our own internal solutions to develop this whole like ML ops uh, flow, right? And so the complication is, um, you know, we don't, you know, when, when it comes to us deploying large clusters and, and systems for customers that we have, uh, the way that we've built things is not, you know, typically in a way that we would just repackage it up and, and, you know, share it with a customer. Right. And so uh, we're left, uh, you know, advising uh, folks on like what kind of open source or other solutions should they uh, use? Unfortunately, like in the scheduling space, like run is a really great solution 
um, very close to what we, uh, you know, what we use internally, or very close even to a, like a Slurm based uh, cluster uh, as well. So, but yeah, I think the answer is Heist, like a lot of DevOps, a lot of folks that are focused on building the, the platforms, right, and adapting to the platform. Uh, as we go. So we, we invest very, very heavily in that. And I think uh, a lot of organizations are hesitant to do that. Maybe they'll invest more in the data science. Uh, I also come from a data science background academically. So, you know, I'm not, you know, dinging on that part of uh, things. It's certainly very, very important. Um, but I think I see that folks don't invest enough on the DevOps or MLOps portion of, of things. Yeah, it's that's an that's an interesting one because I mentioned it a couple of times, but it had it had quite the impact on me a week of KubeCon, both from uh, talking to people, the parties, and everything combined. Um, but I I noticed a lot of more ML platform building people that I, I had conversations with, and we talked. You mentioned DevOps, so we've we've gone through the whole cycle, right? IT ops, DevOps, ML ops, now. LLM ops, I've seen it a couple of times. So what? So so what's next for Nvidia? It's, uh, is it going to focus on uh, what is it? QC ops, quantum computing uh, operations? Because I've seen that's that's a that's a big thing for you guys. No, I, and I don't I don't think. Yeah, I mean certainly there's a yeah, quantum computing uh, portion uh, that we invest in, but I don't think building tools in this space and ML ops. I don't think it's going away anytime soon. Similar to DevOps, not really going away I, it's only going to accelerate right yeah i had a the, somewhat of a devops background and 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 i i jokingly say it was a lot of dev a tiny bit of ops and i think that's slowly but surely merging a little bit more and 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 becoming like more 50 50 i think with ml with ml ops a lot of focus on ml um and less on the ops side and and i agree i think when when we talk to the people implementing like a product like run ai it's typically the devops people that the ones that are building the platform for the ml engineers for the data engineers for the data scientists so yeah hey michael you mentioned um uh, slurm in your in your environment and i know you know nvidia also makes all the ngc containers where they're packaging up various tools for in, in containers um, and, and you mentioned KubeCon a few times. Can you talk a bit about how you actually uh, test those NGC containers in a Kubernetes environment to convince yourself that, yeah, we've packaged this correctly and we're actually um, getting results that we want? I mean, you've got yeah, really wide, really wide question. variety of things. Yeah, yeah, very good question. And and at one point, you know, as part of this debate that we have internally, you know, Slurm versus Kubernetes. You know, part of the de the debate like several years ago was, well, Slurm isn't container, you know, native, and that's why right. we should go more towards Kubernetes. Um, no, I mean, we we test a lot of our uh, almost, yeah, all of our containers on a super pod, what we call like a super pod like system. That's a DGX cluster running mm -hmm. Slurm. Um, and so that's, you know, primarily, uh, you know, and all of our AI researchers that are uh, you know, doing development, they tend to use these uh, containers that we um, that we produce. So they're very heavily tested on Slurm. They're also uh, heavily tested, uh, you know, on bare metal, just not even running Slurm. And then they're also tested in a Kubernetes uh, environment. So we put a lot of work. Any part of like the uh, you know the, the the work that we put into NGC is testing them these containers in all sorts of different environments. Also. Um, you know, in virtualized types of environments and, uh, you know, like VMware, vSphere, for example, uh, in the cloud, like on all of the major uh, CSPs, uh, we, we run these containers. So, yeah, we're constantly uh, testing them, making sure that they, uh, that they work. I think one area where we may not uh, go as far is like leveraging for example testing within like kubeflow and all of the the different types of open source platforms that one might use these containers in because typically you need to change uh, the containers just very slightly to get them to run uh, in an environment like that um, Correct. but yeah, yeah i mean we, we can't cover everything but we try to go as far as we can at least in covering the the basics um, but yeah everything's automated we we do a lot of um, a lot of these uh, these types of tests before we actually publish uh, the containers, 
um, you know, on NGC. Uh, and that there's just a lot more that I'm not mentioning that we do. It, it's just a long list of security checks and all sorts of uh, virus scans and, you know, uh, vulnerability uh, scans uh, before we actually uh, publish those uh, uh, containers. Yeah. yeah, I was just thinking that it made sense um, to in, in that sort of environment to use Slurm because of the uh, fewer scheduling conflicts. It's basically a batch a batch system, whereas Kubernetes, if you overload your cluster, you just jobs just stop running because there aren't enough resources. Right, and and you need just, I mean, if you're running uh, those same uh, you know containers in Kubernetes, there's different. Uh, concerns typically, right? Like in a Kubernetes environment, you um, want to configure Kubernetes in such a way as to lock down, uh, you know, lock things down so that if you are scheduling to a particular node, you can't necessarily gain like root access or um, mm -hmm. you can't see what someone, what other jobs uh, someone might be running in the cluster, right? So those, those are different considerations from Slurm uh, where you know, if, I don't know if you're familiar with like Pixis and Enroot, um, which is Enroot is our more minimal uh, container runtime that we produce uh, ostensibly for like a Slurm type of environment. Okay. Um, and and there you don't have to have as much uh, considerations as you have for like, you know, uh, your, 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 your Kubernetes type of uh, environment where you're running containers. So um, yeah, just very different uh, considerations uh, depending on the environment good good question i, I did see uh an, an, a virtual hand being raised by uh and i'm going to butcher your name and that coming from someone with an unpronounceable name as well but is it mode uh you can just call me taha taha yeah. okay uh, hi, so uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, it was very, very insightful. Uh, so just to give you a bit of background about uh, the work that we are doing. So I'm working with an Italian consultancy called Reply, and we are a premier AWS consultant. So I think we are working primarily with AWS right now, and uh, we are setting up uh, a machine learning operations team, and we are using SageMaker right now. So I have a couple of questions. Uh, and the first question is because we are very much in the beginning part of our journey, uh, of our MLOps journey. Uh, do you have any advice or any best practices uh, that we should follow or, or we should think we should like look out for uh, right now? And uh, where do you see is the uh, most scope? Like because SageMaker is like quite mature uh, at the moment and is like very end to end. Where do you see is the most scope for innovation uh, in SageMaker or like in the, a much broader sense? Yeah, another really good question. If you're using SageMaker, you're totally right. Like it's you're pretty, you're in pretty good hands from a feature perspective. It's pretty end to end. Um, the issue that I see <clears throat> typically in a platform, you know, that's based on any of the major CSPs is that you're mm, you know, you're, you're, de you're developing on a platform that you'll have to stick with and it'll be difficult to migrate from, from right? And especially if you are uh, starting to run into issues where you have greater compute demands and you want to go, for example, on-prem, yes, like AWS and the, you know, major CSPs are coming out with solutions, uh, you know, for that. You could create like an outpost, like an AWS outpost, um, but generally, it's going to be more difficult to move on-prem. It's going to be more difficult to kind of like, uh, you know, uh, go multi-cloud and leverage multiple clouds at the same time. You know, so that flexibility is something I wouldn't discount. Um, at least, uh, you know, it maybe it's okay, I think, to start with a platform like that. But eventually, at some point, uh, just like you wouldn't build your, you know, build a startup uh, at, at some point uh, on, uh, on AWS, you'd want to migrate at some point because you'll be paying, you know, millions and millions of dollars. And <laughs> you have to, you have to consider that at least out into like the near, uh, not, not too distant, uh, future. Right. So that's why, you know, at NVIDIA, like we're very passionate about like what kind of solutions like run AI can we use that are agnostic of the clouds of on-prem can we deploy anywhere? Um, that's a big uh, push for us. And if you're asking for the biggest gap, that's what I would single out. I wouldn't say there are huge gaps 
um, in terms of the ML ops flow, because on AWS, there's just, you know, even if, it, if the function doesn't, a feature doesn't exist in SageMaker, chances are you could find, you could piece together something else that exists on AWS, right, uh, to, to fit your need. If you're missing a sort of, a certain type of database, you know, uh, you can you can kind of stitch something together. So like you're, you're, it's great that you're starting with that. I think that's a great place. But yeah, just as you're engineering things for the future, I would think about how can I, how can I produce like an architecture that's going to be more agnostic uh, as I as I you know as I grow. Perfect. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think I think the agnostic part is an important one because we we actually see people running into the availability issue in in not only AWS, other other clouds as well, because we all know it's it's uh, it's a limited resource uh, GPUs, and um, having to then all of a sudden go to a different region. Data gravity is an issue. Security is an issue. Um, there there's a lot of things that tie into that, and 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 giving it a more holistic, like agnostic approach will at least or at least plan for it, start researching it is, is definitely a good one. We see that the same when we talk about the whole MLOps stack, we see a lot of uh, organizations starting with one platform because that's it, they'd love to consolidate. We don't want them to do more platforms. We'll start with one tool, but then in the meantime, it's like plan to build something that allows you to use more platforms and more solutions and stack them together because it's not very realistic in the landscape right now, but also in a market that's developing this quickly and where like new uh, uh, enhancements are being done like every other week. Um, it's not realistic to 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 stick with one thing. So I think that's that's definitely something we see. That's more my two cents. Uh, I'd like to throw in there. And I think we're actually at the top, we're over the hour. Um, so uh, and, unfortunately, if you have any more questions, don't hesitate to put them in the, the Discord uh, uh, server because that's where we wanna keep to continuing this conversation. Um, and um, yeah, thank you so much for joining. Uh, also you, Michael, and, and thanks for like all the logistics and setting this up and being the power behind this Aiken um, and everybody who joined and asking questions and or turning on video, loving it. Um, keep an eye out uh, for all of our other Beers with Engineers sessions and uh, have, a, have a great rest of your day, morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you may be. Time agnostic. <laughs> Time agnostic, exactly. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, thank you very much, guys. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Michael. Thanks. Cheers.